We're going to get right to you. Our Bibles, we're going to go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 7. Now, if you don't know where Proverbs is, it's right next to Psalms. If you don't know where Psalms is, Psalms is right in the middle of the Bible. Conveniently put there by God, so when you're in a time of trouble and need, and you don't know what to do, and you're crying out, just open your Bible right in the middle, and you will find the greatest comforts and strengths to get you through the hardest times. So let's read Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, unused book in the Bible, that's what's, which is really sad because all the wisdom the world needs, all the wisdom you need for daily living is found in the book of wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Let's bow our heads. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We pray, Father, you would just uh, take over this message. Lord, let it truly be yours, not mine. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know you do, Lord, and uh, let your spirit shine through, Lord. Uh, if the message is a great one, it'll be you. If it's a flop, it'll be me. So we'll look for that, Lord, and we know if we trust you, you'll take us where we need to go today. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's message title is the second most important thing to ask God for. And I don't know if you guys know what it is. Um, because sometimes we get so focused on the first and third thing to ask God for. And now I probably really have you confused because what's the first and third thing we're supposed to pray for? Well, the Bible is very clear on prayer. And if we don't have our prayers answered, it's because we're not following prayer protocols. Uh, and we must. God is a God of protocols. He's a God of order. Look at the seasons, summer, spring, winter, fall, the earth rotating, the earth going around the sun, 365 days, 24 hours in a day. Everything is purposely ordered. And so God purposely orders everything in our lives. Everything should be followed, not haphazardly. It should be followed distinctly as God has ordained. So we need to get that. So Let's get to uh, the point right here. Let's start off with the first thing. Do you know what the first thing is that you're supposed to pray for? Okay, Forgiveness and salvation. Okay, If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, okay, you really don't know anything, and you're not going to hear anything. You're not going to get anything. And what does that mean? Well, it's not to just believe that God exists. If that doesn't get you into heaven, it doesn't get you anywhere. The Bible says that Satan believes in God. Okay, Even the devil believes, as Striper's latest album title is. It's a true point. Even the devil believes, but he doesn't love him. He doesn't follow him. So you have to make sure you know where you are with Jesus Christ. Okay, That he came to this earth. He died for every single one of us because of the sin that separates us from our creator. And I like to use uh, analogies. And lately I've been using the porcupine analogy. Okay, You can't hug a porcupine, right? And without Christ, we're porcupines, and God wants to hug us and carry us and get us through, but we have a problem. We've got quills. Quills are our sins. doesn't matter how little you sin, how big you sin. If you have a little half of a sin, it still keeps us from God. Um, if you have a big sinner like me, uh, you have a real problem. So God can't hug that which he can't get near. So what God does is he says, hey, you got a quill problem. You got a sin problem. You can't fix it. You can't pull your quills out. I tried to do that. You know, I tried to pull my quills out. I tried to live perfectly. Uh, can't do it. Uh, I think I lasted for about 20 minutes. It was the longest I can go without sinning. So that was a good day. Uh, but it was too tiring and too exhausting. And I said, God, I can't do it. He goes, I know you can't. That's why I sent my son. If you could do it, I wouldn't have came to the earth and died on the cross if there was another way. So I take away your quills, and God asks us, do you want your quills taken away? You have to say, yes, Father, please do. I want to be embraced and carried by you every single day of my life, and when I enter into eternity, I want to spend eternity with you. So that's the first thing you've got to do. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've got to call on him, Acts 2.21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the wrath to come. Saved from the judgment for our sins. Saved from an eternity separated from God. In Mark 1.15, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. 
Repent means to have a change of mind about our sins. Realize they're a big problem because they keep us from our big God. But our big God has made a way, but we have to want it. We have to want it. Can't save ourselves. So that's the first thing you need to pray for. If you've never prayed that prayer and say, God, help me. I'm crying out to you. I don't understand everything, but I know there's got to be a creator, and I want to know who he is, and I want to be saved, and I, want, I, and I know I'm not, per I'm not perfect like him. Do that. Okay. If you're not sure what that means, come see me, one of the elders or the, the deacons of the church, and we will lead you to that truth. Okay, third thing to pray for, and this is the, our favorite part. We all love this part, okay? This is where we get to ask God for what we want, okay? Your desires in Psalm 37, 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Uh, verse 7, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not because of those who prospereth in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger. That's a tough one. Forsake wrath. Got to let go of that wrath. And fret not thyself in any way wise to do evil. Lord Jesus Christ in Mark 7, 7, uh, Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be, off, uh, shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man of you is there of you if a son asks prayer? So God, uh, Lord Jesus Christ is using this example. Okay? He's trying to tell us that if we, if who ask him okay so that's the third thing god we, you know we can ask god for things we can ask him to deliver us from our fears and the needs and our losses and our pains and our sorrows and our finances and all those different things but this is the point we miss the second most important thing that we're supposed to ask for which by the way if you understand what the second most important thing to pray for is, it will determine what you pray for in number three. Because if you don't understand this, you're going to pray improperly for number three. Okay? So this is the order you must follow. Salvation first. Come to know God as your Lord and Savior through faith in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection from the cross. Okay? Third is ask for your desires. But what's second? Okay, what is second? Well, the ability to know what to ask for in the third question. To know how are we supposed to live? What are we supposed to do? I know about you guys, I'm really confused lately. I don't know what's going on in the world. I don't know what's going on in the church. I don't know what's going on anywhere. And trying to figure out in my head, you know, beating all conspiracy theories, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. I don't know, and it leaves me upset, confused, and filled with anxiety. Well, it's because I'm not asking God for what? The wisdom to understand how to make good, godly choices in all matters we face. I've been saying this a lot. A lot of people say, Pastor, I gotta move, I gotta move. I got everyone's moving, packing up. I know what I'm wanting. I don't know where I'm going to, but I'm getting out of here. And you know what? Talking to a friend who just, did that recently, and he says, man, I just was so in the, you know, pack, I ran down, I moved, now I'm not so happy. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was a good place to go, and now I'm all alone by myself, I got no friends. Uh, people, before you make any important decisions in life, in your love life, in your money life, in your family life, in your business life, in your future, your careers, anything, you have to know how do you hear what God is telling you? You can't know in your wisdom. You know, the older I get, the, realize, the more I realize how much of an idiot that I am because I don't even know where I'm going half the time. And I think I do. But without Christ, you know, I learned I can't even walk without him holding my hand like a little child. He has to be my father. Which brings us to our keynote scriptures for this morning. Uh, let's go in our Bibles. 1 Kings chapter 3. See if you can find that. Okay, if you can't, that's okay. Takes a while, you know. I still have some hard times finding some things in the Bible. I love the book of Habakkuk, and I always have trouble finding it. 
Um, but anyway, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Isn't that what we all want, right? Isn't that what you want God to do? To knock on your door tonight when you're asleep and hear an audible voice saying, Linda, what do you want? I'm pointing to Linda there, making her really embarrassed. <laughs> we love Linda. Uh, we love everybody here. But imagine that. This is a real account. Can you imagine God saying, okay, what do you want, my child? Let me know. Now, it's a good question. If God was to ask you that, what would be the first thing you would say? Because, you know, I see people talking about this all the time. And, you know, the first thing we would say is often not what we should. But let's, let's move on here. So Solomon, okay, a believer, king of Israel, Solomon said to God, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, David, king of Israel, great mercy. I watched my father. You loved my father. You love my father. According as he walketh before thee in truth. So David was blessed as he obeyed God in his truth. And in righteousness and in uprightness of heart of thee. And thou hast kept him with thy great kindness. Kept him for him this great kindness. That thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. So David, king of Israel... Uh, stepping down and his son Solomon is taking over and he's a little bit nervous because he's going to take over something a nation you know I think if I was asked to be president I'd be a little nervous uh, I think people should uh, think very carefully before they make that decision and Solomon uh, continues with his conversation with God and he says, And now, O Lord my God. So the one thing we know here is Solomon already took care of the first part. He knows that God isn't just the God of creation. God is his God. Okay? Remember, God has to be your God. And that's a choice that you have to make. So he says, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. You chose me, Lord. To be king. And he says, people, important thing. And I don't know how many times I'm going to say this. Humility is the key to exaltation. Look at what King Solomon says before he's king. He goes, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go or to come. People, if you think you know everything and you know where you're going and you don't need anybody and no one's going to tell you what to do, you're a fool. I've lived my life like that and I learned... I don't know where I'm going. I, I learned that I'm a child that doesn't know how to take care of myself. And I need a father, an Abba father, to hold my hand, wipe my nose, and get me out of all the trouble I get myself into. And he says, I not know how to go, come or go. Verse 8, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, the people of Israel. A great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for a multitude. And listen to what Solomon says, which shows he is so not like us. And why we need to be like him. He says, give therefore thy servant. And notice he doesn't say I'm a, I'm a, a joint king with you, God. We're both kings. No, he goes, I'm a servant. Until you can get into the place of servanthood, God, you're king. You're a God. I'm just a servant. How can I serve you? Until you get into that position and understand it, you don't understand anything. We're not, God is, our, is not our celestial servant who just waits to you know, take care of us. No. He's king. He's God. He's creator. We need to serve him. So he says, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge the people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Man, isn't that something that you want to know how to judge between good and bad? Man, my whole life, I had a problem with judging between good and bad, okay? A lot of times, things I thought were good were bad, and things I thought were bad were good. I have a problem. I am uh, choice deficient, okay? I know not how to make good choices in my own strength. So what, is, what does he say? God, help me, how, help me to make good choices, I don't know what I'm doing. How am I going to lead your people? How am I going to lead my own life? 
I don't know how to do it. Humility. And people, keep in mind, that doesn't just apply to ruling a nation. It replies to your lives. You don't know how to lead your lives. I don't. You don't know how to lead your families. I don't. I made a lot of mistakes in that area because I did it my way instead of God's way. We don't know how to lead our nation. Certainly, it doesn't seem like our leaders do. Gee, what would they have to do? Ask God for wisdom. Get us out of all this mess in the blink of an eye. We don't know how to choose our careers. Right? How many times, I know when I was in high school and I graduated, man, I changed my career goals multiple times. Started out with a drummer in a heavy metal band. That was my first goal. It was a very uh, wise, wise choice to become a famous rock star. Obviously, it didn't pan out too well, because I'm playing in the backyard in Center Reach uh, to a couple of people. So that wasn't a good career choice. Uh, and then I had many other choices. God, I think I want to do this. I think I want to do that. Uh, and if I would have asked God, he would have said, you know, you know, what you need to do is you need to be a pastor. Because that was certainly not on my list. Okay. Following God wasn't even on my list. I didn't even know where I was going. So God is there for our futures. And guess what God said to Solomon? Okay, this is, and listen to how God answers Solomon's wise response to God's question. Verse 10. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Why was God happy with what Solomon said? And, you know, I have a pet peeve, and people always say, don't talk about what other churches are doing, but I'm going to talk about what other churches are doing. Because you're going to church, and they're telling you, ask for money, ask for fame, ask for this, ask for that. God owes you all these things. It's all about fame, prosperity, health. Just pray for that. You know what? I have proof, once and for all, that that's wrong. Listen to what God said in verse 11. And God said unto him, Because you have asked this thing and has not asked thyself long life, you have not asked for riches for thyself, nor asked the life of thy enemies, but has asked for thyself an understanding to discern judgment. Because of that, you didn't ask for fame and fortune and wealth and power over my enemies. Like everyone's telling you, you should ask for Listen to what God says. You chose wisely. Verse 12. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given you, bam, supernatural, instantaneously, a wise and understanding heart, that there would be none like thee before thee, nor after thee. No king will ever arise like you. Instantly, God gave Solomon supernatural wisdom. But check this out. You know what? This is the icing on the cake. But people, you don't build a cake from the icing down, do you? You build a cake from the cake up. And you finish with the icing. And listen to what God says in verse 13. And I have also given you what you have not asked for. Both riches and honor so that there shall not be anyone wise kings like you all thy days. And, but there's always that, there's that little caveat, okay? Let's not forget that little powerful word, if, okay? God says, and if thou will walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my judgments and my commandments as your father David did, then I will lengthen thy days. Now, I think you got the gist of the point here, but there's a couple of more points and then we'll close here. And we got something really cool. And when I say cool, I mean cool to finish up with, okay? Because if anybody says, Sandwich Bible Church, they're so hard, they're so tough, they, they preach really hard things, and they never give us candy, okay? <laughs> you might get it today, okay? Just to prove all the naysayers, okay? Oh, you'll get a good laugh. Now, before we close, a point and a question to consider. When God offered that 
choice to Solomon? Was it just a one-time event that only was for Solomon? I don't believe it was. I believe God offers it us to us also. Not that we're going to be kings, but check out Proverbs 4, verses 5 through 9. God, and now this is speaking to everyone. Proverbs 4, 5. Get wisdom. It doesn't say get a Lamborghini. It says get wisdom. It doesn't say get health. It doesn't say get prosperity. It doesn't say get your desires, get your wants. The first thing you do is get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. You know why? Because we forget it. Because things that glitter seem to get our attention. A little funny story. When my uh, boys were really young, you know, bring them to the toy store section. And you know what toys they always went after? All those little ambulances where you push the buttons and they go, beep, beep, you know? They were like, they would be gravitated to all these noisy toys with flashing lights on. And they'd get them home and they'd play for like two days and they would break. But the toys like Lincoln Logs, you know, and Erector Sets, things that last and you play for, for a lifetime, they weren't attracted to those. They were attracted to glittery things. That's what we are. We're basically children. I've come to the conclusion after years of research and study, okay, uh, I am a child. I haven't changed much since 18, okay? It's a big problem. It's a very big problem. I like to have fun, I like to laugh, I like to play, I like toys, and I don't want to be an adult. Telling you guys the truth, you might want to fire me after this, but I've come to this realization, uh, I have an immaturity problem. But thankfully, I have a good father who knows how to work with his child. And he doesn't give me glittery things until I have the wisdom to choose what glittery things I want. So let's continue there. Okay, Proverbs 4, verse 6, forsake her not, okay? God is talking about wisdom. Why does God keep hounding us? Don't forget wisdom, because we don't want wisdom. We want stuff. Forget her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her. Love who? Wisdom. Now, not the world's wisdom, God's wisdom. And she shall keep thee. Verse 7, this is where we started. Wisdom is the principal thing. And what, what, what are we raised with? Happiness is the principal thing. No, it's not. You will not be happy until you have wisdom. And you can't get wisdom until you cry out to God. You can't put the cart before the horse. People, it's finally out there. Proverbs verse 7, the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the principal thing, not someone to fall in love with you and you know and whisk you off that can come but not before wisdom wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom it's like god saying duh do you get it i'm just making it really clear for you wisdom is the most important in case you're not paying attention you need to get wisdom oh but that's how i am i'm kind of very slow oh i need to get wisdom okay because i don't have any i get it god Wisdom is the principal thing, get wisdom. And with all the getting, get understanding, okay? But listen, you can have wisdom. What does that mean, yet not understanding? Well, you can buy all the books in the world on psychology or on business, whatever. But if you don't read them, if you don't understand what they're talking about, if you don't use what you've learned, you've got nothing, just a lot of books, okay? Verse 8, exalt her. And if you're interested in why God refers to his wisdom in the feminine gender, well, you have to listen to my study on that. I did a special study, why does God? Uh, I actually did it on Mother's Day. Okay, if you remember, you could uh, look up that on YouTube, Moms and the Word of God, okay? And, uh, and you will understand why God keeps referring to his wisdom in the feminine gender. So God says, exalt her. What does that mean, exalt her? Take wisdom, put it on the top of your list. Not where am I going to move or who am I going to marry. Wisdom, top of the list. Exalt her as everything, like a life jacket when you're drowning. And if you do, and it's the cause, of effect, the cause and effect here, exalt her, and what will she do? Wisdom, she shall promote thee, bring you up to the next step or stage in your Christian walk. If you feel you, you're a Christian 
and you have you know, remained the same type of Christian for 30 years, you haven't changed, you're not embracing God's wisdom. You're embracing what God offers besides that, the other things, and you're forgetting the princes. For us today, we can cry out to wisdom. And the reason why I know we need to do that because God says in the book of James, let's go quickly to the book of James. Do it perfectly on time. This is awesome. James chapter 4. Why is it important to know God's wisdom before you pray for anything? You've got to pray first for salvation, okay? Second for wisdom before you pray for what you want. Why? I have proof. You see, without scripture, I can't back anything up. It's not my opinion. It's God's truth. James 4.1. James says, whence comes wars and fighting among you? Why are we having so many problems? Why can't we get along in church? Why can't we get along in our communities? Why can't we get along in our state? Why can't we get along in our country? Why can't we get along in our world? James says, come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? We all want what everyone else has. James says, verse 2, ye lust, you want a lot of stuff, but you don't have it. Ye kill and you desire to have to get that stuff, and you still cannot obtain it. Ye fight and war, yet ye have nothing. Why? Because you ask not. What? Ask not. What? You didn't ask for the right thing because you don't know what to ask for. Verse 3. Ye ask and you don't get it because you ask improp improperly that you may consume it upon your lust. Meaning, we ask for ourselves things before we know the wisdom to know what to ask for. Does that make sense? Anybody? Shake a head. Thumbs up. Right? We're not getting what we're praying for because we're praying for things that we shouldn't be praying for. God says, I'm not going to give it to you. You don't even know. You're just praying haphazardly. Give me this. Sometimes in God's permissive will, he says, okay, I'll give it to you. Not because you need it, but because you want it. And, you know, and I use the analogy all the time. If our children said, you know what, mom and dad, I'm tired of eating meat for dinner. I want ice cream. I want ices every day, all day long. How do you teach a child not to do that? Okay, I tell you what, you are going to eat ice cream three times a day, nothing else. You want it, it's not going to be good for you. And there'll come a point when you want to throw up and say, I want regular food, no more ice creams. Hey, does anybody, this is a real, talk about a bizarre segue. Did anybody, who ever watched Jimmy Neutron with your kids show? Okay, you guys are not cool. <laughs> Jimmy Neutron, I love Jimmy Neutron. And it was, it's, it's a kid's animated thing. And there's this one episode where he has this, he, uh, he always is able to uh, come up with, you know, these machines that make things happen. And he wants his birthday to be every day. You ever see, you remember that episode? So every day he wakes up and his family, happy birthday, Jimmy. There's cakes and presents and it's every day. It won't go away. He can't stand it. He's like, wants to throw up. All he's eating is birthday cake and getting presents. His room, he can't even move in his room. He got so many presents. He finally has to say, no more birthdays was a bad idea, okay? I think it was a pretty profound point. I lost you guys. You guys are not up on this stuff. Jimmy Neutron, that's your assignment. You need to go home and watch the Jimmy Neutron birthday special, okay? So we don't know what to pray for. And I'm going to close with a scripture that you might say, hey, there's this guy. You know, you read that last week. You're getting lazy, okay? Well... The Word of God, we can, I can, you know, what, you know what's so amazing about the Bible? We can read this scripture every single week for the rest of our lives. And it'll speak truth and power every single time you read it. Because we are going to read it again because it's going to make another point. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Okay, first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6, verse 4. The words of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the great I am. God with us, nothing less than God himself. Jesus says, Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. Gee, I've learned that. I'm learning that. 
For you will either hate the one or love the other, or else you will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or things. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you're going to put on, is not the life more than meat and clothes and houses, and isn't it more than that? And then Jesus reflects back. We're outside. We can see the birds and we can hear them and everything. It's awesome. Jesus says, look at the, the birds of the air. They don't worry. They don't sow. Uh, they don't collect for, you know, uh, 10 years in the future. You know, they're not like, you know, investing in stocks and, you know, thinking about how we're going to make it next year. You know, the drought coming. You know what? They don't reap. They don't sow. They don't gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? In case you don't know it, God takes care of the birds, and he takes care of you, okay? Insignificant birds. Somebody just told me, I think it was Sister Rory said that a bird, uh, a couple of birds died in your property. Is that right, Rory? Right? Where are you? Where are you? Okay, I see a hand. And she told, I saw her posted on Facebook, and I said, you know what? Do you know that not only you saw those birds, but God did. Matter of fact, God knew before the birds hit the ground that they were there. God said there's not a bird that falls from the tree anywhere on the planet, and God doesn't know about it. If he is that in tune to every single bird, every little, you know, these little twinkly uh, seedling things that fall down that I can't stand, he knows every single one that hits the ground before it hits it. He knows... 20,000 years in the future, 20,000 years in the past, exactly what's going to happen. So Jesus continues. Verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to a statue? Which one of you can change your circumstances? Worrying about health, worrying about the future, worrying about the country, worrying about your love life, worrying about this. Can your worrying, and people, when I say this, I'm also speaking to me, okay? I haven't mastered this. Sometimes I, I get it. Sometimes I forget it. Uh, but I need to live it. So I'm not pointing down to you. I'm pointing also at myself. Which one of you taking thought can add to a statue? Which one of us can change the course of our lives by worrying about it? As they say, uh, worrying is like a rocking chair. It gives us something to do, but it doesn't get us anywhere. It's like a you know, exercise bike. You know, I've been pedaling for like six hours. I'm still in the, I'm still in the bedroom. I haven't even made it an inch. That's what worrying is like. And then he goes on. He's not leaving this creation point here. Verse 28. Why take thought for your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Flowers are not worrying about what's going to happen to them. They just do what they were supposed to do, glorify God. The flowers glorify God. The animals glorify God. Creation glorifies God. Why don't we glorify God? And he goes, and yet I say unto you, and look at a great tie back to Solomon, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Isn't that a cool tie back? God says, remember Solomon that I that I told you about, how he asked and he asked for wisdom, right? And, and I made him the greatest king and he was a glorious king. But you know what? Even us in our greatest days, you know what? We're not even better than, a, you know, more beautiful than a flower. God says, keep that in mind, okay? Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, you know, you, you know, your grass grows, we cut it down. I don't like cry over, I cut the poor grass, those little pieces that fell off, I have to have a memorial service for them. No, I cut the grass, we throw it away, it rots away, okay? Jesus says, wherefore, if, if so, if God makes the grass grow, which today is, tomorrow is cast into the oven, the fall comes, this grass will all be gone, the leaves will be gone, Shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So Jesus says this in these last couple of points. Take no thought saying, well, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What, what happens if I can't buy food? What if I lose my job? I, ah, I don't know what to do. I'm falling. God says, don't you understand for after all these things? Do the, everyone wants this stuff. 
But your heavenly Father knows that you need this. God knows what you need, and he will make sure. As a parent, do you know what your children need when they're little, right? You all know. Do you provide it? Yeah, you give them food, shelter, diapers, medicine, whatever. You know what they need. They don't know what they need, but you do, and you take care of it. But meaning what? And we're not done here because there's one important point. Now, we read verses 24 through verse 32. Jesus is doing a lot of talking, a lot of promising. But if we don't read verse 33, none of these promises mean anything. Because we can't pray for these promises until we pray for part two of our prayer system. Okay? We can't pray for these things and say, God is not providing for me. God is not providing for me. God says, I'm not going to provide for you until you do this first. Okay? And what's verse 33? Right? Is it not seeking God's wisdom after salvation? Look at verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And meaning, and if you do... All these things from verse 24 through 32 shall be added unto you. You're not going to get them unless you seek God's kingdom and his righteousness first. It can't be the last thing. It has to be the second thing we seek. So in closing, if you are not sure of your position with God in Christ Jesus, make sure you're right with God today before you leave. Just cry out and say, Father in heaven, I'm a sinner. Forgive me, Lord. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and right and rose again the third day for me. And he gives me eternal life. And no one will be able to pluck me out of his hands. And he will get me through heaven, earth, everything. And then after you do that, we need to all pray. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you when you go home today, I want you to pray this. 1 Kings 3, 9. And say, give therefore thy servant understanding. An understanding to heart to judge that I may be able to discern between good and evil people if you don't know how to discern between good and evil you're going to choose evil and think it's good and you're going to choose good and think it's evil ask God for his wisdom through the power of the Holy Spirit and what does Jesus say in John 14 26 but the comforter which is the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send will teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. And then Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives peace, give I unto you. Let not your heart be... Man, we need to, we need to tape this on my forehead, you know. Get some scotch tape or something. And this, let not your heart be troubled. Let not... That's the Creator's promise. Don't let your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Because a troubled heart leads to a fearful heart. Jesus says, I give you peace. But not like the world gives you. God, I just, I would feel better if COVID was really gone and everything was back to. It's not going to give you peace. It will never give you peace. You, you can have everything you want. And think that'll make me happy and I can lay down finally and go to sleep. It won't. There'll always be something else. There'll be another sickness. There'll be another war. There'll be another problem. There'll be another issue. It's never going to go away. The Bible says in this world you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God says I give you peace. You can't put a price tag on it. That you will be rock solid. Nothing will move you. The world can be crying and screaming and you'll say my father loves me. I've, I am justified in Christ. I need not worry, for my Father will take care. And when I see the birds and I see the animals, gee, he takes care of them. Okay? I don't see them walking around pacing, going, oh, man, the seed supply is low this year. I don't know what we're going to do. Guys, have you seen the low seed supply? This is a problem. They're having little huddles, business meetings and stuff. No. They wake up and they're singing. Ever notice birds start off in the morning singing? Wonder what they're saying. You know what they're saying? They're praising God. Why do birds sing? First thing they do in the morning. How do you know that morning's coming? I hear the birds singing. The Bible says the creation cries out to God. The creation knows them. They're singing to God. 
They're not worrying. Why aren't we singing to him? Which is why we're going to sing to him right now. Let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, uh, I pray that this message made some sense, Lord. Uh, I don't talk down. I, I talk to me. Uh, I need these things too. I need them desperately, Lord. And I forget them. I, I get them. I hold on to them for a little bit. And then the fears and the worries, they get back to me. And next thing you know, I'm freaking out and I'm pacing around. And I got to get, get myself situated again, get back in the game. I pray everyone here knows you as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.